Uh, good morning, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, may I call Robert Wilson, please? Yes. If you could take the Bible in your right hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the and truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing. Thanks. Make yourself comfortable. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Um, Wilson. As you know, my name is uh, Jason Beer, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Can you give us your full name, please? Uh, do, do you wish me to stand? No, you can uh, remain seated, please do. Uh, Robert George Wilson. And um, thank you very much for coming to give evidence to the inquiry today and for the provision previously of a witness statement. Um, before I ask you questions about that witness statement and indeed um, uh, other questions, the chairman, um, I think, will deliver a warning. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Um, morning. You're giving evidence today, and my understanding is that you will, in all probability, return to give evidence on a separate occasion uh, before Christmas. So what I'm about to say relates to both those occasions. You're probably aware, given that you're a solicitor, that a witness at a public inquiry has the right to decline to answer questions put to him by counsel to the inquiry, by any other recognized legal representative, or indeed by me, if there is a risk that the answers to those questions would incriminate the witness. This legal principle is known in shorthand form as the privilege against self-incrimination. Mr. Wilson, I've decided that fair fairness demands that I remind you of that privilege before you begin your evidence. I should also say, however, that it is for you to make clear to me, in respect of any questions put to you, that it is your wish to, reply, to rely upon the privilege, uh, if that is indeed your wish. If, therefore, questions are put to you by any of the lawyers who ask questions, or by me, which, do, which you do not wish to answer, on the ground that to answer such questions might incriminate you, you must tell me immediately after such question is put. At that point, I will consider your objection to answering the question, and thereafter rule upon whether your objection should be upheld. I understand from Mr. Beer that you have uh, received legal assistance in respect of giving evidence to the inquiry, but that you are not represented at the inquiry today. Um, I don't anticipate that that will prove to be a problem, but if I am wrong in that anticipation, and at any stage during your questioning, you ask my permission to seek um, advice from a lawyer. I will consider what you have to say about it at that point uh, and make a decision. Do you understand everything that I've said, Mr. Wilson? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Thank you. All right, carry on then, please, Mr. Beer. Thank you. Mr. Wilson, you should have in front of you um, a copy of a hard witness statement in your, uh, hard copy of a witness statement in your name, dated the 11th of May. Um, 2023. Yes. Um, I think there are three corrections that you would like to make to it. Yes. And, um, if we can display it on the screen so everyone can see, uh, WITN 04210100. And I think the first correction that you wish to make is on page 21 at paragraph 44. Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> um, you'll see in the second line there's a sentence that begins having conducted previous trials um, counsel I, th I think it's no. when the horizon IT system yes so if we scroll down yeah so it's the second line when the horizon IT system was first implemented I instructed senior counsel who had undertaken a number of prosecutions to provide an advice for the criminal law team. 
Um, I understand it included specific wording to cover the production of computer records and wording to cover the production of business records. Council instructed had also re received training on a computer terminal that would be used by subpostmasters, counter clerks, and staff conducting transactions with members of the public. I cannot now recall the full extent of the advice prepared by Council, but recall that it was a detailed advice. Do you wish to delete the entirety of that? Uh, I um, do. The sentences that I've just read? Yes, I do. So from the words, when the Horizon IT system was first implemented, all the way down to detailed advice? Yes, please. <clears throat> Uh, secondly, um, if we turn please to page 24, and it's paragraph 52 at the top. Um, you say the CLT um, did not prepare a generic witness statement for expert witnesses. I cannot recall comparing witness statements generated by anyone at the post office or Fujitsu for use in criminal cases. Do you wish to delete the remainder of the sentence from so am unable? Yes, yes, that's correct. To the end of the sentence? Yes. And then thirdly, please, um, on page 30... At paragraph 72. If we just scroll up a bit so we can get the context, please. And a little bit further. You're dealing here in paragraph 71 and 72 with an email that uh, uh, Mr. Simpson sent to you in October 2010. And in paragraph 72, you say, I do not know what the issue was that had been reported by Fujitsu and concerned Mr. Simpson. Uh, do you now wish to delete those, I do. those words in that paragraph, the entirety of paragraph 72? Yes, I do. With those three amendments, are the contents of the witness statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Um, as the chairman has said, I'm only going to be asking you a limited number of um, questions relating to phase four of the inquiry today because you're coming back on the 12th of December kindly to um, give us evidence on uh, some case studies yes. that we're conducting, and um, three in particular in which you were involved. And I'm not going to ask you about the detail of any of those three case studies um, uh, uh, today. Uh, just before we get into um, the detail, can we go back to page 21, please, of your witness statement? The passage that, um, uh, if the highlight can go back on, that would be good. The passage that is highlighted, um, could you explain to us just in general terms, please, uh, why you now wish for that to be deleted from your signed witness statement? Yes. Um I uh, change representation. Uh, recently. Stop there. Um, if you can give the answer in a way that does not um, involve uh, telling us um, about communications between you and your lawyers, um, that may be preferable. It's a matter for you whether you include in your answer any reference to such communications. But if you do refer to such communications, there's a chance that you waive privilege over those communications and other communications. So just be aware that when giving the explanation, um, it may not be necessary for you to involve communications with lawyers. Uh, basically, I uh, re recently reread my statement, and for some reason, um, I, I don't know why, but it suddenly occurred to me that in fact I wasn't in charge at the time Horizon was implemented. The reason I was specific about counsel and named counsel to the inquiry was because he was someone who on a regular basis almost exclusively gave me written advice uh, which was uh, thorough uh, and I, I worked with him on a number of um, issues. Uh, what was his name? 
Stephen John. Yeah, sorry, carry on. And um, that's why I could, was so specific about who uh, a council. And um, so far as the other details that are uh, in there, I, I had a picture in my brain of what the advice looked like, but it was a completely false picture, and I don't know why I believed that I was in charge at the time. And it was only when I reread the statement recently. In the fourth line there, you say, I understand uh, that it included specific wording to cover the production of computer records, the it being council's advice. Yes. You use the word, I understand. From where did you get that understanding when you were writing the statement? From, uh, I had a picture in my brain uh, of, of, of that piece of evidence. The words I understand may suggest that you had been told it by, uh, told the information by somebody else rather than I recall that it included, I believe that it included, or even it included. No, nobody told me. Why did you use the words I understand? Uh, loose terminology. It's, uh, I, I don't know why I used the words. At the end of the paragraph, uh, you say council instructed had received training on um, a computer terminal that would be used by sub postmasters um, and others. Is that in fact true? Yes, th 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 so that, that is did true. apply to Mr. John. Yes, it did. You said uh, the reason that you recently recalled that you had not commissioned this advice was that you realized that you were not in charge when the Horizon IT system was first implemented, yes. i.e. about 1999-2000? Yes. Would you have needed to have been in charge in order to have instructed council to provide an advice? Um, not necessarily, no. Why did your memory of you not being in charge prompt you to um, wish to delete this paragraph? Then? Uh, because when I realized, when I rejoined the team in 2002, in May of that year, um, I, I, I realized that I wasn't in charge at the time. But why would being uh, not being in charge um, mean that you, uh, as a mere in inverted commas, member of the team, could not nonetheless commission advice? I don't think I was asked to do, do that, uh, undertake that task. It's quite a detailed recollection that yeah. you include here, albeit it ends with the words, I can't recall the full extent of the advice. Yes. Have you received any information from anyone that the inquiry has searched for a copy of that advice? and has asked the post office to search for a copy of the advice and there has been a nil return? No. That hasn't played any part in your decision to wish to delete this part of the paragraph? No. Thank you. Can we um, move on to page 24, please? And um, it's the words from so am unable to say whether a generic statement had been developed either by Pole or Fujitsu for their witnesses that you wanted to delete. I yes. think the explanation may be more straightforward in this respect. Can you just explain why that you, you wish to delete that? Uh, I received uh, an additional bundle uh, about a week ago, and in the additional bundle was, was a generic statement. So a generic witness statement for um, witnesses giving um, evidence, which we're going to look at later today. Yes. Uh, you've now seen that, and so you realise that that's, um, what was said there is incorrect. Yes, that's right. And does the same go for the third correction? Exactly. The later provision of documents showed that your memory was incorrect. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, that can come down. Thank you. Can I start, please, with your um, 
career qualifications and experience. I think you're a solicitor, is this right, having qualified in October 1980? That's correct, yes. And so that means that when addressing the events with which we're concerned, between the introduction of Horizon in 2000 and you moving over to the Royal Mail Group in April 2012, you would have had between 20 and 32 years post-qualification experience? Yes. Before you joined the post office um, in uh, mid-1986, I think you had previously worked for a short period of time as a court clerk in the magistrate's court, is that right? That's correct. Um, you then worked as a prosecuting solicitor for the Northumbria police, is that right? I did, yes. And is that before the advent of the Crown Prosecution Service? Yes, I transferred across uh, into the CPS from Northumbria Police. And that's when um, the prosecuting responsibility used to fall to essentially the county solicitors? Yes. And then um, in, was it 1985, um, upon the creation of the CPS that you moved across? Uh, to, to Post Office Limited? No, from Northumbria Police to oh, yes, yes. the Crown Prosecution it, yes, Service. Yes, it was a, it was a, a Chupi uh, transfer. And then um, as you said, in mid-86, you moved across to the post office. That's correct, yes. Can you um, explain in summary form, please, the nature of the regulatory obligations of an in-house solicitor, as you understand them? Uh, my duties? Yes. Uh, my principal duty was to run the uh, prosecution team uh, and uh, ensure that the prosecutions were... Uh, properly dealt with in accordance with the uh, legislation that applied and our, um, uh, our um, prosecution policy. I uh, was responsible for managing uh, agents because we had agents throughout the country and council throughout the country and, uh, and Wales. Uh, so uh, I needed to uh, understand how to brief them and inform them of what, what, what was we were doing. I had a team. Mr. Wilson, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, yeah. My question was pitched at a slightly higher level than in the job that you, in fact, were doing from mid-86 onwards. What were your responsibilities? I, I was asking what your understanding of the, the regulatory obligations, the duties mm -hmm. of an in-house solicitor uh, were at that time? Well, my, my duties uh, were to ensure that we properly uh, prosecuted uh, on behalf of Royal Mail uh, in accordance with the legislation and in accordance with the Code for Crown Prosecutors when that, that came out in 1986. Uh, uh, so, uh, and uh, Additionally, the prosecution policy that we ad adhered to the rules and regulations that we'd prescribed for ourselves in terms of prosecuting offenders. Can you please give us your understanding of your professional duties as a solicitor and how they sit with your, uh, how they sat with your duties to your employer as an in-house solicitor? Uh, well, my duties as a solicitor were to be uh, independent. Uh, and objective in terms of prosecuting offenders, which I felt that I, I was throughout the uh, uh, throughout my employment with uh, uh, post office and Royal Mail. Did you understand those duties to include an obligation or a duty owed to the court as an officer of the court? Yes. Some um, research published by the Solicitors Regulation Authority has suggested that some in-house solicitors may have not had the support and internal controls within their organisations to maintain their independence and that this may be particularly risky where the commercial interests of the organisation are not in alignment with the solicitor's regulatory obligations. When you worked as an in-house solicitor for the post office between 1986 and 2012, 
did you ever believe that you lacked the support and in internal controls that were necessary to maintain your independence? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, I was never under any pressure from any individual within the post office or indeed any team within the post office to, uh, to, do any, uh, to take any action uh, that I was not happy with. Did you ever feel that your independence was at risk where the commercial interests of the post office were not in alignment with the, uh, your regulatory obligations? No, I, did, I never felt that at all. In this period, did you understand that you were required to comply with the Code of Conduct for solicitors and the principles issued under it and with the predecessor equivalents of the Code and those principles? Yes, I did. Did you understand that at all times that included a duty to act with independence and that included to act with independence from your client? Yes, I understood that, and, and I never felt under pressure at any stage during my career uh, to act other than independently. Were there any policies, protocols, or guidance in place during your um, extensive period in office that were designed to protect the independence of in-house solicitors and in-house counsel in your team at the post office? No, not that I recall. And why not? Uh, uh, why not? Is that, that's a good question. I, uh, I, I never felt under any pressure to do anything whilst I was a solicitor. Um, I had a, we had contact with the Law Society and um, I don't know why we didn't do it, but, but there were no, no rules or protocols in place that I can recall. Looking back, do you think that would have been a, um, a good idea, in uh, particular for maybe um, lawyers less senior um, in the organization than you? that explained to them the nature of their duties and how that was going to be carried into effect um, on the ground in the post office? Uh, yeah, it would have been a good idea, but at the time I, I never thought it was um, uh, necessary. I didn't think that we were ever, either myself or my team, were under any pressure from any department within Post Office Limited to do, take action or, or not to take action uh, if we didn't uh, uh, wholeheartedly agree with that course of action. Uh, so in 1986, you moved into the criminal law team in the post office. I did. And I think you stayed there for 26 years. Uh, yeah, I, I, until, I don't, don't know, <laughs> probably. I think 19, 1986 until April 2012, Yes. Is 26 years. Right. And you prosecuted Horizon-based uh, cases, i.e. cases that relied on data produced from the Horizon system from the year 2000 onwards, is that right? I think even before that, I think um, in 1999, uh, Horizon came in, didn't it? Well, there was a rollout in 1999, and um, uh, so some... <coughs> Uh, sub-post offices will, in a staged process, have been um, uh, given the equipment and uh, asked to operate it b before 2000. Right. So um, uh, it, you recall prosecuting cases in 1999 based on... Um, well, uh, there was always a, a time lag between uh, in investigating an offence and a suspected offence. A suspected offence, yeah. and then uh, actually issuing summonses. So there was always a time lag. So some of the cases that we first prosecuted under Horizon must have come in, I, I, I guess, in 2001, 2002. Well, I was going to ask you, how long following the rollout of Horizon did the post office wait 
before it started to prosecute its sub-postmasters? I, I don't know the answer to that one, but um, I know that pension allowance order fraud, which was the big fraud prior to Horizon, continued until 2005, and I understand some of those cases must have uh, uh, ha had evidence from the Horizon system. What, if anything, were the criminal law team told about the reliability and accuracy of data produced by the Horizon system during the national rollout period in 1999-2000? I really can't remember. Um, I, I imagine we were told something, but I, I can't remember. But it must have been uh, that the, the system was uh, uh, viable and, uh, and appropriate. Can you recall whether inquiries were actively made by you and your team of post office departments in that regard? We've got a new computer system. It's producing data. We're founding our charges on the basis of this data. Can you tell us whether the system is uh, reliable, please? Well, uh, that, that request would have gone via the investigators uh, to obtain evidence from the Fujitsu people who were producing uh, the evidence and would have appeared in their uh, individual statements. Right from the start? I, I imagine so, yes. You would expect it to be a necessary element of a, an investigation to establish the reliability of the data upon which a, an investigation and then potentially a prosecution was founded? Yes, I would. And why would you think it um, simply just to be a, a, an ordinary, necessary part of the investigation? Well, because it, it, if they couldn't establish that the uh, system was working properly, then the, the, the evidence had no value. And so reliability of the data was um, a fundamental or essential part of any investigation founded upon such data? Uh, absolutely. To your knowledge, um, was your team made aware of um, the high severity acceptance incident um, known by number 376, which concerned um, discrepancies and lost transactions in the course of the national rollout? I don't recall that at all. Do you remember something called acceptance incidents? No. Do you recall that as part of the contractual arrangements between uh, the post office and Fujitsu, there were a series of criteria that had to be met uh, before essentially the system uh, was permitted to go uh, live across the national estate? No and that incidents were raised, acceptance incidents, as they were called, were raised if there were problems. Do you recall that? I, I, no, I don't recall that at all. And that there were a series of those that concerned the integrity of the data that Horizon was producing? No, I don't, I don't recall. Similarly, would it be right, therefore, that you don't recall the team being, aw being ma made aware of Havana a high severity acceptance incident 218, which was about um, a series of sub postmasters um, raising issues about their ability to operate the system when it came to balancing their accounts and unexplained discrepancies <coughs> appearing in their accounts no. when they did the weekly balance. No, I wasn't aware of that. The way you explained matters earlier suggested that you thought that the post office started prosecuting on the basis of Horizon data relatively soon after Horizon was introduced. I, I thought so, yes. It's been suggested that some, by some senior post office witness um, evidence uh, given to the inquiry that the post office would, quote, give the benefit of the doubt uh, during and immediately following the national rollout period 
because of the natural difficulties that would be encountered in introducing and then embedding a new system. And so that if discrepancies arose, uh, postmasters would be given the benefit of the doubt and not prosecuted. Was that something that trickled its way down from those senior post office individuals to you and your team? No, uh, I, I, my dealings were purely with the investigators, the investigation team. I had no real contact within Post Office Limited <coughs> hierarchy above me, and nobody of a senior uh, level ever contacted me uh, and gave me that information. Like a sort of a moratorium or a, a period of grace, whilst the um, uh, system was bedding in and sub postmasters um, learned how to operate it rather than moving straight to prosecuting them. That may well have been the case, and my memory, uh, again, may, may be faulty. I just got the impression that uh, when Horizon came in, that uh, we, we, it was being used and we were obtaining evidence via the investigators. Did um, uh, you or members of your uh, criminal law team meet with uh, any technical staff from post office to understand or gain an understanding how Horizon worked? We, I think the answer probably is yes. I, uh, I don't recall the meetings, uh, but I, I think the answer probably would be yes. We certainly, in terms of training, uh, offered training to a number of council and uh, agents who we used uh, for advocacy. And we had uh, a number of training sessions throughout the country where the uh, Horizon system was up and running and could be used by those people. So I imagine, uh, because I went on training sessions as well, that some explanation was given uh, at that time as to as to what, what, what the Horizon system did. How long did your training on Horizon take? Well, I think I attended at least two, maybe three sessions with council and possibly agents throughout the country. I remember rec uh, going to Western Super Mayor on one, and I remember in London uh, having a number of council who, uh, who turned up to, to one of the training sessions. Did those um, training sessions involve gaining an understanding of uh, how data was produced by the Horizon system and how it can be tr could be translated into evidentially sound material for the uh, uh, use of an investigation and a prosecution? Okay. Or was it more about, this is what a keypad does, this is what the system looks like, this is the touch screen, that kind of thing? Yes, it is more the latter explanation you've just given, not, not the technical uh, details. Were there um, um, any meetings uh, between you and post office technical uh, teams to gain an understanding of the uh, potential causes of errors or faults within the system that may affect the quality of the data that it produces? No. Uh, were there any uh, meetings between you or your, uh, to your knowledge, other members of the criminal law team with ICL Pathway, later Fujitsu, at this early stage to determine what were the available records and data streams from Horizon in order that uh, at post offices' disclosure obligations could be met? No. Wouldn't that have been necessary when a national system was being rolled out involving a a new species of evidence across 19,000 odd branches 
that may be used in a range of prosecution contexts to understand what are the data stores within this system, which of them are going to be accessed and which of them are not in order to found a prosecution? Uh, I, I think we got that information via the investigators, no doubt in their reports, and um, via the witness statements from the experts and the Fujitsu personnel. So we, the instructions that we got would have come from uh, those two sources. And we would have understood from the witness statements that, uh, for example, ARC data was being accessed or transaction logs or whatever the information was that uh, we were relying on and were being exhibited via the witness statement and an explanation um, from the investigator. And I think that if, if I had not understood something, um, I would have asked the question. I'm talking about rather than an ad hoc and piecemeal um, uh, uh, process that develops where perhaps a series of emails are exchanged between investigators and um, individual Fujitsu staff to say, have you got this? Can Dave go and find that? Has Mike got a copy of that, mm -hmm. which we've seen? A fundamental... Um, understanding right at the beginning of the process. These are the data streams, these are the data stores in this new computer system. Uh, we will expect essentially at a service level for investigators to find um, and obtain X material. Uh, it isn't necessary for them to find or obtain Y material. It may well that be that we did ha have a written explanation of, of the system, uh, but now looking back, I, c I can't remember, I, c I couldn't swear on oath one way or the other, uh, but I, I never, looking back now, thought that I didn't understand where they were getting information from uh, and what type of information was being relied on. I d don't think I ever had a memory that actually this all needs to be explained to me. Uh, presumably that process was one of revelation to you bit by bit then. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't know. It, maybe they produced a document that, that w we read and we understood. But um, as I say, looking back, I, I couldn't swear to it. In May 2002, you were appointed head of the criminal law team. Yes. Um, who was your line manager at that time? Uh, I think it was Catherine Churchyard. And what um, was her responsibility? What was her job? Her, she was general counsel. Did your line manager res remain the general counsel for the post office? No, it didn't. Um, Can you explain the changes, please? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I don't know whether Catherine Churchyard re retired or uh, what happened, but at some point um, we were told that the team was going to be uh, disbanded and made redundant. Um, I know that the security director um, at board level uh, argued to uh, retain the team and uh, he was successful. So after Catherine Churchyard, I believe I reported to Andrew Wilson. Um, and I reported to Andrew Wilson for a number of years. I don't know how long. But at some point, um, General Counsel uh, uh, asked to have the team back. And I think that was Doug Evans. And I then reported to Doug Evans at each stage of the transfers, when I was reporting to Andrew Wilson, I had a dotted line to general counsel. So uh, I, I attended team leaders' meetings and, and such, such like, so I wasn't divorced completely uh, from uh, the uh, leadership I I in the legal uh, teams. And from Doug Evans, I think he left it 
in about 2011, possibly 2012. And uh, there was a new general counsel who I, in fact, in the middle of it, I may well have reported to uh, Tony Marsh for a short period of time when Andrew Wilson retired. In fact, I think that's right. And so you reported um, to the head of security? Yeah, to the head of security, yes. Yeah. When Andrew Wilson retired, um, I reported to uh, Tony Marsh and then for a, uh, for a short period and then after that uh, reported to General Counsel Doug Evans until about 2011. Did you ever report to the company secretary? No. Do you remember Jonathan Evans as a name? I, I do know him, but I, I, I never reported to him. Uh, who, over the period between the year 2000 and the year 2012, was um, responsible at board level for oversight of criminal prosecutions and confiscation proceedings? Probably Jonathan Evans, but I, I couldn't swear to that. And why would Jonathan Evans in that period be respons have uh, responsible responsibility by way of oversight for the conduct of criminal proceedings in any confiscation? Because I believe the security director who I reported to reported to a board member, and if I remember rightly, it, it was Jonathan Evans. So the head of security reported to the company secretary? As far as I can recall, yes. You told us that um, it was only for a short period of time that you reported to Tony Marsh. I think so, yes. What about um, other periods of time then? Who um, did your report report into at board level? Um, I'm looking for the identity across this 12-year period, so yeah. when Horizon really nationally rolled out until when you left in April 2012. Yeah. Who in the board would you say had responsibility for the post office's conduct of criminal proceedings? Um, I think Jonathan Evans did initially. And after that... I don't know, if you could give me some names, I could probably... Well, there's, um, over that 12-year period, there, is, uh, there are um, a large number of names uh -huh. um, with frequent changes. I, I, I never had any dealings with anybody at board level. So that was going to be my next question. To yeah. what extent did you have access to the board? No, I, I never had access to the board. I never had any dealings. Well, I say I never had any dealings. Uh, I may have got the odd telephone call from somebody now and again, uh, uh, wanting a, a, a general answer to a criminal question or, or something of that nature, but nothing significant. Um, what, was there any regular reporting by the criminal law team to the board on its prosecutorial activities? No. Not that I, no, no, there wasn't. Um, I, Reports for cases that were concluded went to uh, general counsel and uh, the security director and possibly s somebody else, but I don't think it, they even went to, to board level. And when you say reports on concluded cases, yeah. um, do I understand you to mean we've prosecuted Mr. X or Mrs. Y, that went to Z Crown Court, Mm. There was a guilty plea or a trial. It resulted in a finding, usually of guilt, mm. um, and there were these confiscation proceedings, £20,000 recovered, something like that. Yeah, but basically, yes. And, and I prepared, at the end of the month, a list of um, number of new cases, cases concluded, which teams they related to, because there were other teams within POL other than POL, it was Royal Mail Parcel Force. Um, so I gave, at the end of the month, uh, a, a fuller description of what had happened in that month, so people could get a picture of what was going on in the team. 
apart from, as, you, as you've just been talking about, the individual reports of concluded cases. Was that more from a personnel management perspective? Uh, yes, probably, yes. Appreciating that you um, didn't attend board meetings and, as you said, didn't have access to the board, what was your understanding of how it, the board, exercised oversight of the post office's prosecutorial function? Via the security director. I, th I understand that the security director will have gone to board meetings now and again, possibly not every board meeting, but um, I certainly recall Andrew Wilson um, telling me information that had happened at, the, at a board level meeting. I can't recall what it was now, but um, I do recall him going to boards now, uh, board meetings now and again. And the, the head of security, um, Mr. Marsh or Mr. Scott, reported to the security director? I don't know about Mr. Scott. I had very, very few dealings with uh, Mr. Scott. Uh, the security directors I, I dealt with and I recall were um, uh, Andrew Wilson and um, Tony Marsh. You're, you're referring to them as um, security director. Mm. By that title, do you mean head of security? Yes, head of security. Rather than a director of the company? Uh, yeah, no, uh, yes, uh, head of security. Was it your understanding that that position, head of security, attended board meetings? I think they did occasionally. I, I don't think they did every, every board meeting, no. But I think um, I do remember Andrew Wilson coming back from board meetings and telling me uh, something that was pertinent at the time. Would I be wrong to take from your evidence that there was... Um, from your perspective, modest, intrusive oversight of the post office's prosecutorial function by the board? Yes, it's modest. It would be modest? I think so. I think we weren't causing difficulties. I know we're here because of difficulties. We weren't causing difficulties in terms of any criticism from uh, any outside authority. Uh, we were doing the job. Um, the vast majority of cases, uh, individuals pleaded guilty. Um, and I don't think that our heads went over the par parapet effectively. And so the board were just letting you get on with it? Is that, is that, 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 that the, the feeling my... we should come away with? I think so, yes. Uh, moving on, you tell us in your witness statement at paragraph six I wonder whether we can turn that up, please. It's um, page four. Um, can you see paragraph six in your dealing here with the more general rationale behind the practice of bringing private prosecutions. Yes. And then if we go over the page, please, to page seven. Sorry, to page five. Um, in the second line, th uh, second sentence, you say, investigators were often recruited from counter staff because of their familiarity with accounting documents and procedures it was felt that such in-house knowledge of accounting systems, practices, and procedures was difficult to acquire overnight by police officers who had no knowledge of the workings of the post office. It was not, sorry, it was therefore not felt appropriate to pass the investigation of crime within the post office to the police. Yes? Yes. And so the investigators, and you're talking about here the investigators within the security team, is that right? I am, yes. Uh, were historically and usually um, counter staff, i.e. counter clerks or the like? They weren't always. Uh, oc occasionally we did recruit police officers, and I think we did recruit people from uh, outside 
uh, post office limited. So it wasn't exclusively people who had had audit functions or whatever within post office limited. But um, the majority, you use the word here often, yeah. um, were counter clerks or ex counter clerks. A, a lot of them were, yes. Uh, they were people who had no investigative or prosecutorial experience? No. What um, role, if any, did the criminal law team play in the um, training of these um, former counter clerks? We did, we did have a role. Um, we, uh, as part of their training, we arranged mock trials. Um, I, I can remember addressing new recruits on, on various different topics. Um, and uh, we would support the uh, training wing uh, if and when needed. Um, was it needed? Uh, yeah, I, th I think that um, we, uh, I, I was involved in um, a, a number of training packages, yes. And um, what were the topics for which the criminal law team um, offered assistance in the training of the former counter clerks who were now the investigators? Um, well, I belie believe disclosure was a, a, a big training pack package. So the investigators were um, trained in their disclosure duties, is that right? The policy and standards team, as I can recall, prepared uh, the, some of the training uh, packages for new investigators. Um, and from time to time, um, I would have had an input. Um, but we had a specific training wing who had a continually rolling function of training not just the new investigators but uh, the existing uh, uh, investigators um, throughout the years. Um, so, uh, and they, they also produced, the training wing also produced uh, almost on a weekly basis any amendments to uh, any legislation or procedures that were uh, uh, that had been decided. So it wasn't just uh, here's your training. Um, it was a continual process, and we had what would, I would call the intranet, where all of the training packages, and the processes and procedures, and the policy documents were stored so that uh, uh, the investigators could historically look back and see, see what was going on. But they weren't just left to their own devices. That, as I say, there was a, a continual uh, process of updating uh, their knowledge. And, and I remember going on, um, for example, a, a, a training package throughout the country on the preparation of committal papers because I think we were having uh, difficulties or we, we'd identified uh, some problems or some gaps. And so we put together a, a training package for that. And so from your perspective, would you say overall that the um, training afforded to investigators was um, in relation to their duties under the law uh, was um, adequate? Well, hopefully more than adequate. Um, what epithet would you use to describe it? Well, well, I would like to think that it was professional. And so no investigator could point towards the training and say, well, I didn't know that the law required me to do that because I wasn't properly trained. He shouldn't be able to, no. no. Would you agree that if um, investigators were mainly drawn from a post office counter clerk background and therefore they had no prior expertise in criminal investigation and criminal prosecutions, it was important that the post office's policies 
that regulated their activities were clear and precise as to the uh, roles and duties and the obligations that they owed? I think the roles and duties that they had were probably not in the prosecution policies. They were in the processes and procedures uh, manual that the training wing will have um, put together. And so there was a high-level policy, there was a process and procedure document. Yes. And then there was some training that trained on that policy, uh, that process and procedure document. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, that's basically how it went. The, uh, the prosecution policy was a, a very high-level document. And I, I imagine that uh, most of the information that would have been pertinent for the investigators was in a, uh, is it was in a document uh, with a heading, pro, uh, you know, processes and procedures. If you had any concerns about um, gaps in investigations or flaws in process, for example, a, um, a reasonable line of inquiry was not being pursued, what would you do? Well, I'd, I'd contact the in investigator directly. And would that be it? Well, not necessarily. It depends on what the, the, pr the problem would be. So, for example, what I was referring to earlier, the, the committals. Uh, I remember putting together a package on committals because we were getting uh, statements and exhibits that were all over the place and um, uh, were not dealt with appropriately. Uh, and so we put together a package. So if I'd identified a problem and it was um, something that I uh, thought was either serious or persistent, then I would contact um, one of the, one of the um, investigators in the, uh, not, not necessarily the training wing, but the, um, the wing that dealt with processes and procedures, and um, we would get our heads together and we'd sort the, the issue out. And so, to your understanding, between this period of 2000 to 2012, um, all investigators ought to understand, uh, ought to have understood um, their duty of candor when applying for a summons to institute a prosecution? That they should have done, yes. They ought to have understood their duty to pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry. Yes, uh, it would be implicit in what they're doing that they should be understanding that, yes. Well, would it be, Im I'm asking whether it was explicit, that they well, were trained that there was a duty under the law to pursue lines of investigation that pointed away from the guilt of the suspect, yeah, as well as towards it. That, that sh would have been included in a, a training package. Uh, they would have all understood uh, that it was part of their duty to establish the reliability of the evidence, including the data upon which they were founding a case against the suspect. Again, that, that sh that would be in a, in a training package, and they, they should, should have understood that, yes. What steps were in place to monitor the professional performance of investigators against the standards required by the law? Sorry, can you really repeat the... Yes. What steps were in place to monitor the professional performance of investigators against the standards required by the law? Well, I think that if there had been a failing, then that issue would have been raised both to myself and the head of investigations. And depending on what the failing was, it would have either been addressed individually or uh, as a, a group issue where we would have put out communications to uh, address any, any problem. Um, so it was only if failings were identified that something would be done. I, I'm talking about something more systemic and fundamental, uh, monitoring the performance of people against, in their conduct of their investigations and prosecutorial activities, to ensure that it's not until something goes wrong that the um, balloon goes up. 
Yeah, uh, there was a casework management team where the files from the investigators were forwarded to the casework manager team who then forwarded them to my team, or to me, um, and part of the casework management team function was to uh, check uh, that the investigators had uh, done what they're supposed to have done. I think there was a big checklist which needed to be ticked. And I think that in the event that they hadn't complied with what the processes and procedures were, then the file uh, would necessarily be returned to the investigator to address the issue. So I think this, this middle function uh, was the ca casework management team. And I guess that if uh, there'd been a massive failure or something that was uh, pretty serious, then it would have been flagged up to the head of investigations and possibly myself. So this um, massive checklist, and we might look at this after the, the break, was um, operated by the casework management team who performed a sort of quality control function. Uh, yeah, that's how I recall it, yeah. And how many people were in the casework management team? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I recall going to Leeds, which I believe is where it sort of ended up. Um, uh, at least two or three times, and I, I think there were about, if I can remember rightly, probably about six to ten people in it. And under whose supervision did they operate? Uh, I, I don't know who was the head of the, uh, the team. I can't remember. Were they part of the security department? Well, the, I, th I believe that, that most of them, but it, I may be wrong about this, most of them were ex-investigators, or they'd been investigators and they would have been moved into the casework management team. Now, that might not be 100% right. Uh, some of them might not have been. Um, uh, but I think that at least, uh, I, I don't know, I can't actually, uh, I, I'd be making it up. And were there any lawyers within that team? No. You got the files after they had passed through the casework management team? Yes. And the, the three issues that I mentioned, um, knowledge of the duty of candor, yeah. knowledge of the duty to pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry, Yes. and knowledge of the duty to obtain um, evidence that established the reliability of the data upon which a prosecution or investigation was founded. Were they the kinds of things that the um, uh, casework management team were checking compliance with? Uh, I imagine so. So I wonder whether we can take an early break, because in the light of the answers given, I want to show some documents that I don't think I'm going to be able to right now. So if we took the break early now and came back at 20 past. That's fine, uh, Mr. Beer. yeah. Thank you. 20 past 11. Thank you. So good morning, can you continue to see and hear me? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Orson, can we look please at poll 00119917. You mentioned before the break a system operated by the case management team uh, which involved checking against standards the files that were submitted to them before they went on to the criminal law team. And you mentioned a big long list, I think, or words to that effect. Uh, that, that was my recollection, yes. If you just take your um, time just to look at this. Mm -hmm. Does that look like the big long list that you were speaking about? Pro 
Probably, yes. This is an example. We've got lots of these where against a set of criteria, a file is marked and in the right hand column, a score is given, which if we scroll down, we can see potentially adds up to 100. Um, this investigator got 94 out of 100 for their file. Yes. You see that it says compliance check undertaken by, and it says Paul Sovin, about five lines from the top, in blue, the last bit of yes. blue. Would that be somebody in this case management team? No, I, don't, I think, oh, hang about. Um, yes, it must have been. I think I recall Paul Southern being an investigator. Um, but he may well have been in the, um, the compliance team as well. I uh, see. La if, later on. I see. As you said before the break, that they may be former investigators who've moved on to the case management team. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's my recollection that some of them will have been investigators, and I'm pretty sure. Well, I, I don't know, but I think probably more more had been investigators than weren't, if I can put it that way. Okay, and if we look at this, um, if we just go back up, please. We can see that um, some of the criteria against which um, compliance was judged are um, administrative in nature. Can you see one? The right label was used. Yes. Yes. Um, number four, the correct font, namely, um, there had to be Chevin Light 12 was used. Yes. Yes. Um, if you look at um, number seven, the file was submitted within 12 working days. Yes. Yes. And if you look at um, under offender details, um, at number 13, details of suspect interview and searches as applicable, um, adequacy of interview. So adequacy of interview um, does suggest some, something more than administrative, doesn't it? Yes. Um, a, a qualitative assessment of the adequacy or inadequacy of a piece of investigative work. Yes. Would that be your understanding that this case management team looked at qualitative issues as well, rather than more, the more perfunctory issues like font size. Uh, yes. And then if we um, go down, please, to post-interview details, uh, can you see, at, I think it's uh, 19, um, assessment of evidence available to support charges? Yes. Can you see that? Yes. And then two on reliability of witness reported. And so seemingly a check over whether the um, file, the report, contained an assessment of the evidence available to support the charges and the reliability of any witness. Yes? Yes. Uh, for those things, can we look, please, at um, what might be an associated policy document, keeping those two things in mind, and look at poll 0011801. You'll see this is um, a compliance um, document or guide to the preparation and layout of um, red label case files. 
for the security and operations team. Yes. And um, can we go forwards, please, to page seven? And look at the foot of the page, please. Thank you. Essentially, these headings in bold, for the most part, match the criteria that we've seen in the spreadsheet that we just looked at. Do you understand? Yes. And so the one that we're looking at at the moment was the heading against 19 at the bottom of the page, which is paragraph 1.15, assessment of evidence available to support charges. And then over the page, uh, this should contain the investigator's assessment of the evidence available to support the charges detailed in the preamble to the report. Um, it should identify conflicting evidence, statements or admissions and include comment on the demeanor of the offender, an assessment of their response to questioning, um, whether the full scope of the offense has been admitted to and suggested reasons as to why cri the crime was committed i.e. greed or gambling. I've added a few words in there so that it makes sense in English. Was it your understanding, therefore, that um, the case file, and in particular the report within it, had to contain um, the assessment that is set out there? Yes, I think so, yes. And therefore, when we read in the case compliance matrix assessment of evidence available to support the charges, this is essentially what it's being judged against. Yeah, I believe so, yes. And then if we scroll down to 1.17, which is, again, um, the heading, I've skipped over details of domestic and financial um, domestic and financial details of offender. Um, reliability of witnesses. This should contain in the investigator's assessment of the re reliability of any relevant witness or witness statement in the case. And again, that matches the heading in the compliance matrix that we just looked at. Yes. So far as you can recall, um, in horizon cases, did such case files and in particular the offender reports within them contain assessments as to the reliability of the data on which the proposed prosecution was to be founded? I don't know. Um, I. Yeah, I don't know. Would you accept that they should have done, that if it wasn't a witness-based case, it was essentially a data-based case? Yes. An assessment should have been made in the file as to the reliability of the data on which the proposed prosecution was founded. Yeah, uh, yes. But, uh, I think there was a general assumption that the data was sound. Do assumptions wash in the criminal courts? No, they don't. No. What washes in the criminal courts? Uh, it has to be certain. It has to Reliable. be evidence. Yeah. It has to be evidence-based, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know whether Post Office Limited went into that detail. I can't recall. Okay, in the case files that we've seen, mm -hmm. they don't. Right. Do you accept that in a case that's based substantially on um, evidence produced by a computer, there needed to be an assessment in the file which said, our data in this case is obtained from this computer. These are the security controls around that computer, which ensure that it has 
um, as a matter of physical integrity, security. Um, these are the controls that are in place that ensure the information security within the computer. These are, um, if necessary, the um, continuity um, documents that establish the production of the data. We um, have, on inquiry, found that um, the system suffers from some bugs, errors, and defects. However, the evidence is that either um, they didn't cause discrepancies or they didn't cause material discrepancies in this case. That kind of assessment was necessary. Yes. Uh, thank you. That can come down. Uh, can we turn, please, to um, post office prosecution policies and look, please, at um, poll 3030659. Um, if we just um, flip to the end of it, please, which is page four and scroll down. We can see this is dated the, uh, December 1997 and produced by Andrew Wilson. Yeah. What would have been his function at that time? He would be the security director. Uh, back to the first page, please. Um, you, you've looked at this policy and you, um, because it was disclosed to you, way back when, when you um, wrote your witness statement and you addressed it in your witness statement. Yes. Um, you will see that it says that it proposes a rationale for prosecution policy. And that I'm not gonna take you through it in detail, but essentially it reads like a discussion paper about whether or not the prosecutor prosecutorial function should be retained by the post office or not. Yes? Yes. Up until this point, 1997, was there a prosecution policy? Or to your knowledge, was this the first? I think this was the first. And if we look at the foot of page one, under the case for prosecution, Thank you. Um, the post office's prosecution policy appears to have evolved over a considerable period of time with little formal evaluation or review. Would you agree with that sentiment? Yes, that's probably right, yes. And Mr. Wilson identifies that the principles underlying prosecution were deterrence and serving the public interest. And then there's a, a theoretical discussion of each of those at yes. the foot of the page and then over the page. And then he discusses the case against prosecution and identifies three factors pointing away from the desirability of the post office conducting its prosecutions, costs, adverse publicity, and industrial relations consequences. And then there's a, a discussion of each of those, which I'm not gonna address. And then if we go to the foot of the page, page five, uh, uh, paragraph five, scroll down a little further. Thank you. Propose rationale for prosecution. And he says, work which has already been carried out into profiling of internal offenders within the mail enables a rationale for prosecution to be constructed which can inform policy development. In broad terms, offenders can be placed into one of three categories, uh, criminal, irresponsible, um, or irrational, and then he addresses each of the three of them by use of his italics. Can you see that? Yes. And he says the criminal category is involved in theft of mail for personal gain. The irresponsible category is usually involved in willful delay or destruction of mail. And then the irrational category are a minority and are characterized by longer service and crimes which are frequently 
detected, uh, easily detected, e.g. opening the mail and leaving debris. And then at the foot of the page, he says, from the above, it's possible to formulate a prosecution policy as follows, quote, the prosecution policy is normally to prosecute those of its employees or agents who commit acts of dishonesty against the post office for the purpose of illegally acquiring post office property or assets or the property or assets of post office customers and clients while in post office custody where this is deemed to serve the public interest. Other wrongdoings that will normally be dealt with via the discipline code. Was that the prosecution policy until we see the next policy issued in 2010? No, I don't think so. There was, from my recollection, there was a, a prosecution policy in 2007. Was it there for the prosecution policy until 2007? I don't know. I, I would imagine that there would have been a policy in between there at some point. I know that the policies were reviewed every year, or they were uh, uh, referred to as being reviewed every year in the later policies. Um, That's a bit of a distinction, isn't it, that a well, document says that they were to be reviewed and whether they were in fact reviewed. No, I think that I think they will have been reviewed because there may have been changes in legislation which would require them to be changed. Um, but I don't think they were necessarily amended uh, if there was no need to amend them. So I think on a yearly annual basis, the um, I forget which team it was now. I think it was um, uh, prosecution. Um, one of the process teams, I've forgotten the name of it now, would review them on an annual basis, uh, but not necessarily, as I say, change them. Uh, let's assume that this did remain the prosecution policy right. uh, until between 1997 and 2007. Right. Uh, do you see anything wrong, if we just scroll up so we can see the entire statement of the um, policy. Uh, scroll back down, please. It's just a bit in italics. Looks like we can't have... Thank you. This is the post office's policy is normally to prosecute those of its employees. Yes. Um... Well, I think that's the security director um, giving his opinion of uh, the position at that time in 1997. I think the, the policy will have changed when the Code for Crown Prosecutors came out uh, and we followed... The that was a decade earlier, though, in 1986. Right, so you, yes, of course you're right. Um, well, I think the later policies were more specific in terms of uh, referring to the Code for Crown Prosecutors and the requirement that was specified in there for, uh, for have, no, sorry, I'm getting myself confused here. Um, well, it is the problem with that statement that it doesn't say we'll prosecute if there's sufficient evidence to do so. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't say that. But I think the later policies will have said... So I'm just looking at the moment of what may be in operation for a 10-year period, i.e. this document. Yeah, I, I don't think that would have been in operation for 10 years, though. I, I think there, there will have been other policies that have possibly have not been identified. Uh, OK, then. For however long this operated, yeah. would you agree that it's problematic in that it appears to assume that somebody is guilty and doesn't include any evidential test. Yes. It contains no reference to the code for Crown Prosecutors that had been in place for a decade by this time. Yes. Thank you. Can we move forward to the 2007 policy that you mentioned? 
um, poll three zeros three oh five seven eight. Thank you. And um, if we can look just at the foot of the page, it's the foot of every page, we can see that it's um, dated the 1st of December 2007. Yes? Yes. And if we go to the last page, which is page 5, we can see the um, owner of the pro policy is set out and the uh, those who um, gave assurance to the policy set out yes which included you yes and if we go back to page one please and scroll down to 3.1.4 Can you see that reads, the conduct, course, and progress of an investigation will be a matter for their investigators as long as it's within the law, rules, and priorities of the business? Yes. Investigators will ultimately report to the Director of Security with regard to the conduct of criminal investigations. Do you see anything difficult or problematic with that first sentence? Uh, the priorities of the business. And what's difficult or problematic with that? Well, they should be independent. Can we go forward to 3.2.9, please, on page three? Um, suspect offenders will be prosecuted where there is sufficient evidence. I think this is what you were referring to earlier, that later policies um, included a cross-reference uh, to the sufficiency of evidence, and it's in the public interest in accordance with the Code for Crown Prosecutors. In your view, was it sufficient to include a, a cross-reference to the Code in this way, rather than explaining the way in which the Code operated and was to be carried into effect in the context of a private prosecutor, and in particular, where that private prosecutor was the post office? Um, I think the code for Crown Prosecutors would have been more fully explained in the uh, training uh, information that was passed to uh, investigators and new investigators. Um, and the code itself will have, a, certainly in my team, every lawyer had a copy of the code. All of the decision makers had a copy of the code. Um, and rather than break it down in a, what I would say would be a high level document, Uh, in, in this document, the code itself stood on its own, but also will have been more fully explained in the training information, is, is my uh, recollection. Was it recognised that, um, that special issues may arise in the case of an organisation that was the alleged victim of an offence, a possible witness to the offence, where that organisation had investigated the offence, would then decide whether to prosecute the offence, and if so, go ahead and prosecute the offence? I think, I think we tried to divorce the decision to prosecute from the investigation function and my function by uh, putting it into the, the business for a more objective uh, look, look at the decision. 
I think that prior to 1997, the decision to prosecute was made by a senior investigator within the investigation uh, uh, b part of the business. Uh, and subsequently in 2012, it reverted back to the investigator. And I think that was because it was uh, imagined that uh, with this separation of post office and raw mail that in order to obtain consistency because people were changing their jobs uh, within the poll uh, and people were moving people were leaving that it went back to the investigator but that was purely for consistency and within that period the role swapped between I think the head of human resources or nominated individuals within the business. We're going to come in a minute to look at that right. um, decision-making responsibility. Yeah. But are you saying that, essentially, in summary, that the way that the post office addressed the fact that it was um, victim, witness, investigator, decision-maker, and prosecutor, yeah. all in one, was to get the lawyers to make decisions on prosecutions? So far as the evidence was concerned, yes. And to get somebody who wasn't involved in the investigation yeah. to make the decision on public interest? Yes. What this does is it says um, decisions will be made in accordance with the Code for Crown Prosecutors, and everyone had a copy of it. Yes. Everyone relevant had a copy of it. Yes. Was there anything which sat between those two um, poles? We're going to apply the code. Here's a copy of the code, which explained the particular difficulties that may arise in an organization um, that would be investigated and prosecuting uh, theft from itself. I, I don't think that that specifically will have been addressed, but we did address training for the decision makers. Myself and the head of investigations did provide training um, to those people who were making the decision. And I was the contact point uh, for anyone who was a decision maker if they had an issue or a problem or wanted to discuss anything. And what would you train them as to the permissibility or impermissibility of taking into account, quote, the priorities of the business in such decision making? Well, I, I don't, yeah, I don't think that uh, the priority of the business I, I would have trained them on at all. Um, as far as I was concerned, the decision had to be an independent decision. Uh, can we turn forwards to 2010, please, and look at poll 3030580? And if we look, please, at the bottom right hand uh, corner of page one we'll see that it's dated the 4th of April 2010. Can you see that? Yes. And if we just scroll up, please. Um, the owner is said to be head of security at that time was Mr. Scott. Yes. What did it mean to be the owner of a policy? Well, he, he, he will have been responsible for ensuring that his investigators uh, adhered to, to the policy uh, and um, would have been responsible for checking that it was uh, accurate in terms of it, if it was dealing with legislation. Um, and if we scroll down, please, 
and look at assurance and authorised on assurance, what would you understand to mean um, if a person had given assurance for a policy? Uh, that, that they would have um, read the policy, be happy with the policy, uh, happy that it addressed uh, a, a, any, any, any issues uh, and that was not ina inaccurate uh, and have checked that uh, it, it complied with a, a, any legislation that was appropriate. And um, again, what would you understand it to mean if somebody is shown as having authorised the policy? Well, effectively, I think I would have thought that that was that they'd written the policy. Um, and certainly was, were having written the policy or got somebody to write it, uh, that they were responsible for it. And you see in the right-hand column there, it's, it's got a um, date for both of those things to happen. Ought they to be completed against assurance and authorised right-hand side date? Uh, yeah, I mean, the 4th of April 2010. No, do you see under the words assurance and authorised? Oh, right, yes. Um, yesterday, Mr Scott told us that this means nothing because the date hasn't been included. Um, against authorised or assurance. So effectively, he's saying that this is a policy that didn't hit the public domain. Well, he said it. Um, he, he called it a draft. Oh right. I don't know whether it was or it wasn't. I mean, I don't know. I don't think my name is on that policy. No, it hasn't got a review section in it, uh, right. unlike the last one. Uh, I, I don't know. Having not had any responsibility for it, uh, it is what I, I assume happened. Um, I, I can't contradict or add any value to what, what you've just told me. And again, if we go forwards um, to page three, please. We see the policy set out. And under the heading um, protecting the business, yeah. um, it, it reads highlighting crime facilitators. Investigators will identify non compliance with security and operational procedures, non compliance with the code of business standards, failing in management control, shortcomings in physical security. And then under conduct of investigations, um, conduct, course, and progress of an investigation will be a matter for the investigators as long as it's within the law rules and priorities of the business. Investigators will ultimately report to the head of security with regard to the conduct of criminal investigations. And again, do you identify the same difficulty with that? Uh, yes, I would. Um, can we move forwards, please, to um, poll 3030598. This is January 2011. If we scroll to the foot of the page, please. We can see um, the date of January 2011. Can you see that? Yes. And in the top right as well, V2, January 2011. Yes. And um, if we go scroll down to standards, please. Thank you. Um, the general standard is to prosecute those whose suspected offences significantly damage the public interest. Compliance with the code for Crown prosecutors will ensure that inappropriate prosecutions are not pursued. And then at 4.3, the criminal law team will be familiar with both the evidential and the public interest tests in the code and advise accordingly. Um, just in relation to that um, line 4.1, uh, the post office will prosecute suspected offenders um, whose offences significantly damage the public interest. Was that meant to add a gloss to what is the public interest test?
Um, I don't. Th I don't. I don't think that would have been adding a gloss. Um, I don't, don't think it would have been put in there to add a gloss. I think that it's probably the word significantly shouldn't have been added. Well, also, it, it significantly damaged the public interest, whereas the, the public interest test is uh, rather different to that. Yeah. It's whether it is in the public interest to prosecute. Yeah, ex exactly. Rather than whether the offence itself no, significantly no, damages the public interest. Sorry, I, I, I understand what you're saying, yeah. Yes, I agree. That, that's... Um, that isn't the test in the Code of Crown Prosecutors. No. Uh, thank you. Uh, that can come down. Um, in um, your witness statement, you state that um, policies were drafted by the post office. Who in the post office was responsible for drafting policies relevant to criminal investigation and prosecution? I think, generally speaking, it would be the security director, although there were a couple of policies that I understand my name is on. Uh, I can't remember the, the, the year, um, but I can remember why it was probably delegated to me, and it was because uh, we'd had a problem in one of the businesses where the decision makers had effectively put people back on duty despite the fact that we'd uh, recommended that the ev evidential test had been met. Uh, and uh, I think because of that, myself and the head of investigations agreed that an additional uh, clause should go in that particular policy that I signed my name to. You also tell us in paragraph 9 of your witness statement that the policies were owned in the main by the security directors at the time of their implementation. Yes. That, that's Messrs Wilson, Marsh and Scott. Yes. You say that your role was to advise on policies. Uh, what would that um, uh, consist of? Well, that, that would be basically if there had been any uh, change in legislation, uh, any requirements that needed to be altered or removed, uh, and generally give an oversight to uh, what was being written. And in all of these policies, we don't see any mention of, for example, the duty of candour, the duty to pursue reasonable lines of inquiry, and the disclosure obligations of a prosecutor. Yeah, yeah disclosure was a, a massive topic. And I think that the idea of having the policy was to have a very uh, short, sweet, uh, high-level document that somebody uh, who, who was a, a third party could, could read and understand, uh, and that, therefore, disclosure will have been dealt with by the training wing in a much more comprehensive way than to add it into uh, the policy. I, I think we, we, the decision would have been to keep them separate. But for example, uh, we will comply with the CPIA and the code issued thereunder, or we will uh, comply with the Attorney General's guidelines on disclosure and then updating when new guidelines were issued in 2000, 2005, 2010, for example. Not even those cross-references. No. I think, it, I think it was regarded as a, a ring-fence topic that uh, needed to be looked at, at a, on a regular basis and, and no doubt amended uh, as and when the Attorney General made new guidelines or whatever. You tell us that each policy was reviewed annually. What did the annual review consist of? Well, I think uh, the, the, the old policy will have been looked at uh, and checked uh, and uh, a decision would have been made. Is it fit for purpose for uh, continuing for another year or do we need to uh, add or detract from it? 
and who undertook that annual review? I think Ray Pratt was head of the, uh, the, the policy and standards team at the time. Was it the function of the policy and standards team then to undertake the annual reviews I rather so, than the yeah. criminal law team? No, I believe it's, it will have been um, the policy and standards team will have reviewed it on a yearly basis. He may well have come and spoken to me about it and asked of you. Can we look please at paragraph nine of uh, your witness statement, which is on page six? Do you see halfway through, you say my role was to advise the security director and critique the content of those policies. I was also required to review the existing policies and advise on any changes that may be required. Each policy that was developed was reviewed annually, but not necessarily changed each year. Just stopping there. Doesn't that suggest that it was your responsibility to review and critique the content of policies, advise on changes, and to do so annually. Yeah, no, it does. Uh, but I think what would happen was, in reality, that uh, uh, Ray Pratt would come to me and say, we need to have a look at the policy again. And we would sit down and look at the policy. Uh, and um, from a legal perspective, that, that side of it would have been my responsibility. And so for the years that, um, uh, by way of example, the policies said that in deciding on prosecutions um, uh, or investigations, regard is to be had to the priorities of the business, that was simply overlooked, was it? Yeah, I, th I think so, yes. Or did that, in fact, reflect the reality that the priorities of the business were an important element in deciding on what to investigate and who to prosecute? No, I, I, um, I don't think the, the, the business interest was not of uh, any concern to my team. We've seen a series of documents identifying over the years, I'm not gonna take them to you now. Yeah. Um, uh, objectives being set for the um, security department to reduce the loss to the business through investigation and prosecution. Right. Did any of that filter through to your team's decision making? I don't believe it did, no. In the last line here, you say, I was responsible for seeing that any stipulations included in the policies were adhered to. That may be an incredibly broad statement. Yes. Uh, what did you mean by it? Well, well if, if we saw a file that was uh, outside the policy, then that would be my responsibility to identify and, um, and address. You've written that in a, an expansive fashion there, mm. um, w which might be taken to include responsibility for ensuring that all of the investigators were doing all of the things that the policies required them to do. That plainly wasn't the case. No, uh, no, that, that wouldn't have been the case, no. <laughs> so what did you in fact mean then? Well, I, I, what I mean is at a high level, ultimately, I was responsible for every prosecution. It, it, was, my, it was my call. And that um, because it was my call and because it was my responsibility, if I'd identified anything that was uh, outside the policy, then I needed to deal with it. You said there it was my responsibility and my call. Yes. What did you mean by that? Well, I was head of the 
the criminal law team. So I was responsible for the prosecutions. At any particular stage, uh, I could be uh, summoned into court, maybe a crown court, which did actually happen on one occasion. Uh, and I, I couldn't say, well, this is the investigator's fault. I had, to, I had to admit any responsibility if there was a problem, because it, I was in charge. When you said it was my call, did you mean it was your call to decide whether to prosecute or not? No, 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 not, not, not that. Uh, what was your call then? My, my call was I was responsible for every prosecution that we signed our name to. Uh, that's, what, that's what I mean. Can we turn to the decision maker in prosecutions then, please? Um, and can we turn to paragraph six in your witness statement, which is on page four? You set out for us helpfully here. Um, And in fact, um, it's just above that. It's paragraph five at the top of the page. Thank you. You set out uh, for us helpfully here um, the prosecution decision maker. And you say, when you first came into the CLT, the decision to prosecute was taken by senior investigation managers. The 97 policy refers to the decision maker being from the personnel department of each business unit following advice from the criminal law team. This later changed to a nominated representative in the business. That's the policy of April 2010. And the 2011 policy specified the decision maker as the senior security manager for the post office. So just breaking that down, <coughs> Um, in 1997, until you joined, um, decision maker on whether to prosecute was a member of the personnel department. Yes. Say so from human resources. Yes. And it says from um, each business unit, what does that refer to in this context? Uh, well, the business units were Royal Mail, Post Office Limited, um, Parcel Force. I think they were just the three. And so um, somebody in personnel, in our case, from Post Office Limited? Yes. Ah, no, no. I think you... Some of the prosecution policies refer in some of the, in one of the paragraphs towards the end of the policy that Post Office Limited adhered to uh, the general Royal Mail policy, but also had their own specific uh, guidelines, processes, and procedures. And I think it's a paragraph towards the end of uh, the 2007 and 11 uh, policies. We'll come to that um, later. We're, at the moment, we're just dealing with 1997. Right, okay. And um, decision maker from human resources. Uh, yes, uh, that, that must be right, yes. And so did the person from Human Resources have a, co a copy of the Code for Crown yes. Prosecutors? Yes. They were trained specifically by myself and Phil Gerrish, who was head of investigations. We went round the country. We prepared a what was a dummy investigation file. We, uh, and we prepared uh, a dummy uh, standard letter that the... Uh, one of the solicitors would have written in terms of the evidence and the public interest and we gave them a copy of the code for crown prosecutors and we explained and we went through and explained what to look for in the file 
what to look for in the code and went through the uh, public interest te test that was in the code. And that dummy letter, yeah. w was that um, essentially a template for them to issue? N no. I that if, if they decided um, to prosecute? N no, the, the, the dummy letter was a letter that they would receive on the papers that had been written by one of the lawyers uh, authorizing prosecution. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, providing information about the evidence. They, they were the one who authorized the prosecution. And do you know what the um, rationale was for giving the prosecutorial decision-making function to people within HR? Yeah, I think it was basically uh, Andrew Wilson had identified uh, a, a team that was independent of uh, the investigation team and that could give a, a, an overall uh, uh, view of what, what was in the public interest. Somebody who's independent, basically. And so these people would be um, looking at um, the offender report that they were given and um, all of the underlying material, witness statements and exhibits, is that right? Yeah, so they'd be looking at a complete file. And they would be expected to read the um, witness statements and the exhibits? Um, I, actually... Uh... I, no, I, I don't, I, I can picture the file in, in my brain, uh, which seems like a, a large file, but, uh, but it may not have been, it may have simply been a truncated file. In what respect was it truncated? Well, what did decision, it not include? Yeah, the, well, their decision was... Um, whether it was in the public interest or not. They, they weren't there to look at the evidence in terms of whether there was sufficient evidence. Um, we might oh, Hold on, um, why was that? Well, because- where, where does it say that? The, the lawyer was the, the person who made the decision on whether there was sufficient evidence to prosecute. They were simply deciding on whether it was in the public interest. Right, and so the decision on sufficiency of evidence had already been made? Yes, effectively the lawyer had made the decision that the evidence was sufficient to prosecute. What we wanted from them was to make an independent decision on the public interest test. And what material were they given in order to make that decision? Well, yeah, following your, um, your, your, question, your question before the last one, um, I don't know whether they did get a full file now, but they got a, a version of the file. And what was the version of the file? I imagine uh, it, it was I I information about the uh, alleged crime, so it will have been, a, I guess, a report, possibly the, wit uh, the uh, interview, maybe one or two other documents, I, I, I can't remember. And so they made no um, decision at all on evidential sufficiency. No. The, the, um, th that decision had already been taken by a lawyer. Yeah, the, the lawyer had already is effectively saying was there uh, sufficient evidence to prosecute, yes. Your statement says um, uh, that they would take the decision following advice from the criminal law team. Was that advice um, about the public interest test too? Yes. And w w usually the advice would be pretty limited in terms of the size of the theft or any other information that was per pertinent. Can we go please to um, poll 
and look at page four, please. Page four, thank you. Uh, under paragraph six, the prosecution process. This is the 1997 Andrew Wilson uh, uh, policy. Um, it reads, in order to streamline the process and to facilitate a consistent approach, it's recommended that a single point within the personnel department of each business unit should make decisions on prosecutions following advice from the legal services department as to the likelihood of success and the potential from embar for embarrassment to be caused to the post office. Um, that's rather different from how you've explained it just now, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is um, a policy in 1997 that... Uh, I'm only dealing with the 1997 policy at the moment. Right, okay. I've not moved forward to 2007, to 2010 or 2011. Yeah, that, that's not my understanding of what actually happened. Because this, um, on its face, suggests that the HR person is going to make all decisions on prosecution. Yes? It, it doesn't divide it up into no, it sufficiency and public interest, does it? Yeah, I, I'm not sure how you describe this document, uh, the words that you used um, when you actually described the document. But this, for me, is not a prosecution policy document. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a paper that... Uh, I, I, I um, was taking, I mean, I described it as a discussion paper. Yeah. In your witness statement, you say, quote, the 1997 policy refers yeah. to the decision maker as being from the personnel department. Yes. Referring to this. Yeah, no, I, I, I accept that it, it, it was the policy that Andrew Wilson put out, but I uh, think that you, you are accurate in what you say. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's more of a discussion document than a, than a proper policy. Sorry to intervene, but does that mean that there was no written policy, at least that the inquiry has discovered, uh, until 2007? Well, uh, sir, I, I, think, I think there were policies, uh, whether they've been discovered or not, uh, and where they're lurking and what year they were uh, prepared. Uh, but there was a... You know, I'm pretty sure there was more than that, but I can't tell you when or, or where they are. Uh, and I can't believe that it went from 1997 to 2007, 10 years, without a prosecution policy being in place, a, a proper one. Oh, <clears throat> forgive me, but um, the impression I'm getting from you is that this document itself did not become, in the formal sense, a policy. It was, as Mr. <clears throat> Beer and you have discussed, more in the nature of a discussion paper. Yep. Well, um, so that would mean that for very many years, so far as we know at the moment, let me put it in that way, or in, in case um, other people know more than me, so far as I am aware, there is no written adopted policy covering the period 1997 to 2007. Yes, sir, that appears to be the position, yes. We, we can look at paragraph 7 to see what the nature of this document is for a bit um, a further help. It says the proposals in this paper uh, have been formulated, etc., and the personnel strategy steering group are invited to endorse them as post office um, policy in capital letters. But I don't think we've got a document that um, um, either carries that into effect or says, no, something different is going to um, occur. So um, just on paragraph six as it's worded, it would be wrong to take from that that the HR people were making decisions about both limbs of the test, correct? Yes, correct. It would be wrong to take from that that the legal services department were giving advice to the HR team about 
sufficiency of evidence. They were taking decisions on sufficiency of evidence. Yes, the criminal law team were taking decisions. And thirdly, it would um, be wrong to say that the criminal law team were giving advice as, quote, to the potential for embarrassment to be caused to the post office as a relevant consideration. Yeah, that I, I, can't, I don't recall ever doing that. Can we move forwards then, please, to um, 2007, um, at which um, we've looked at already. It's poll 3030578. And it's page three. and paragraph 3.2.9. Um, suspect offenders will be prosecuted where there is sufficient evidence in the public interest, and it is in the public interest in accordance with the Code for Crown Prosecutors. Decisions to prosecute in non-CPS cases will be taken by nominated representatives in the business with consideration to the advice provided by the Royal Mail Group criminal law team. So from 2007, taken out of the hands of human resources, is that right? Um, yes, but it, it was, again, somebody within the business uh, no, I think it was n the wording was used as nominated representative. Yes. Who were the nominated representatives within the business? In 2000. Take, from 2007 onwards, taking decisions on prosecutions. I don't recall which team w was uh, nominated representatives. I, I can't recall. As a matter of practice, from 2007 onwards, who was taking decisions on whether um, a sub-postmaster or a counter-clerk should be prosecuted? Somebody out of, outside of the investigation team. But who? I, I don't remember which team it was. But they were now taking decisions on both limbs of the test, is that right? No. Uh, what was happening then? Well, it was the same as before. Basically, the criminal law team would advise on the evidence, and if there was sufficient evidence with a realistic prospect of securing a conviction, the, decision, the papers would then go to whoever was the nominated representative within the business to decide on the public interest factor. So this is wrong too. Is it wrong? Well, this appears to suggest that both limbs are being taken by this nominated representative. Sorry, both limbs of the test are being taken by this, um, uh, uh, considered by this nominated representative of the business. But yeah. that's with consideration to the advice provided by the criminal law team. Whereas if, on your account, what it should say is, there are two limbs to the test, evidential sufficiency and public interest. The criminal law team will take decisions as to the first limb, sufficiency of evidence, and will make a decision as to whether there's a realistic prospect of conviction, full stop. A nominated representative of the business will take uh, decisions as to the second limb of the test, the public interest test, yeah. in accordance with the Code for Crown Prosecutors. They may do that by considering the advice provided by the criminal law team. Yeah. The nominated representative didn't take decisions on the evidence. It was purely the public interest test. So this, pol this policy doesn't represent um, reality either? Not, not on that wording, no. Um, can we turn, please, to September 2008? and poll 
uh, can you see that you're the owner of this policy? Yes. Um, it, it, it says that it is dated or was created in September 2008, but it's effective from um, two and a half years later. Yes. Can you help us um, with what's happened there? Basically, I think that what that means is that in September 2008, this policy came to fruition. And then between 2008 and 2011, it will have been reviewed each year. But this, uh, in 2011, um, was uh, it being reissued. I see. So the, the update was effective from April 2011, albeit the policy in a, d a potentially different form had been created from and was effective from um, September 2008. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's what this means, yes. Okay. Well, let's take this as being effective from September 2008 then. Yeah. Um, and can we turn to the second page, please? and look at paragraph four and 4.1. The decision to prosecute uh, Royal Mail Group investigation cases in England and Wales will be reached in agreement between the Human Resources Director for the Effective Business Unit or his or her nominated representative, the nominated representative from the investigation team and the lawyer advising. Can you see this is a yet um, further difference from that which we've seen before? Yeah, I, I mean, I think what's, what that's saying is effectively the lawyer will advise. And the, again, uh, I mean, it's not worded in this way, but, but again, the human resources director will make the decision. Which decision? On the public interest test. Again, it doesn't say any of that, does it? No, it doesn't say that. So this is the third policy that we've looked at that doesn't say what it should. Is that right? That's right. So how does that come about? You, you I think, wrote this. Yeah, I... It, it's... I, I don't know how it's come about. It's... Um, it would have been so easy to put it uh, in um, more appropriate wording. But you're telling us that what's written as the prosecution decision-making policy here is not correct in that it did not reflect, reflect reality. Well, in one sense, the human resources director will reach the decision to prosecute um, because he has the final decision on whether it's in the public interest. Um, and the lawyer was advising that the, the evidential test had been met. So it, it just is not specifically referring to those two facts. Well, it, it's saying that it's a three-way decision in which there must be agreement and it doesn't divide the test into two. Correct? Yes. To what extent did a nominated representative from the investigation team, in fact, uh, participate in decision-making on either evidential sufficiency or the public interest? They, I, I don't know whether this is one of the policies which changed um, the wording in relation to where uh, somebody had been placed back on duty or not. Uh, but if this was one of the policies, I think the wording for that included uh, the head of investigations uh, and myself as being 
advising the nominated representative. This was the, what I referred to before, where um, a number of individuals were put, put back on duty and effectively uh, precluded us uh, pursuing a prosecution. Um, can I ask it a, uh, the question in a different way again? Did a member of the investigation team participate, <coughs> sorry, a nominated representative from the investigation team participate in decision making on evidential sufficiency? No. Why does it say that they do? The only reason I can think of is where, as I just pointed out, that we had this, this problem, but no, they didn't. Did a nominated representative from the investigation team participate in decision-making on the public interest? No. Why does it suggest that they do? Uh, I, it shouldn't have. But why does it? Why is it in almost every material respect wrong? I don't know. Can we move forwards, please, to um, January 2011? And uh, uh, we looked at this before. It's poll Remember, we looked at this January 2011. And if we go down to paragraphs 4.3 and 4.4, .4, which is at the foot of the page, 4.3, the criminal law team will be familiar with both evidential and public interest tests in the code and will advise accordingly. Uh, the uh, human Resources Director, or in Post Office Limited cases, the Senior Security Manager, just stopping there. The cases that we are considering are all Post Office Limited cases. Yes. So it's the Senior Security Manager that we are um, considering. Yes. Uh, dot, 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 will act as the decision maker in authorizing uh, prosecutions or not. All decision makers will be familiar with the evidential and the public interest tests of the code for Crown prosecutors and make decisions accordingly. Um, and the document embeds the, uh, the code in it and draws attention to the pages on which the two tests are set out. So does it follow that from January 2011 onwards, the secu senior security manager uh, took all decisions as to authorise a prosecution and they took decisions both as to evidential sufficiency and public interest. It shouldn't have been evidential. So this is wrong too? Yeah. The lawyer would, would have done that, but they did take the overall decision to whether to prosecute or not. So again, this should bifurcate the process between evidential sufficiency and uh, public interest, saying that evidential sufficiency uh, is the decision of the lawyer and public interest is the decision of the senior security manager. Yes. So all relevant policy documents fail to describe accurately the post office's prosecution uh, decision-making process. Is that right? Yes.
Uh, can we um, take that down, please, and move on? Um, in paragraph five of your witness statement, perhaps if we turn that up. Um, which is on page three of your witness statement. Uh, you say the criminal law team's role, so far as the policies and practices relating to the prosecution of sub postmasters, managers, assistants, and Crown Office employees, was to assess the evidence obtained independently and consider whether the evidence was reliable on, and credible. Yes? Yes. And that um, mirrors um, an answer to a couple of questions that I asked you earlier about whether the uh, lawyer was um, to include as part of their function an assessment of re reliability and credibility of evidence. In um, cases founded on horizon data, did the lawyer's function therefore include an assessment of whether the horizon data was reliable and credible? Yes. And did it include that duty even if the suspect had not suggested in interview or otherwise that there was um, likely to be or potentially a problem with the Horizon system? Yes. And is that because of the answer that you gave earlier, that if you're um, founding a prosecution on uh, computer-based um, uh, evidence, you need to assess the reliability um, and uh, credibility of the evidence produced by the computer? Yes. <clears throat> um, is it right that um, there was some resistance within the criminal law team to the CPS um, prosecuting any cases involving Horizon data? Uh, well, yes, we would prefer to have prosecuted our, our own cases. And why was that? Well, because we, uh, we, um, we had a, a team of investigators who were fam familiar uh, with the um, processes and procedures in, in Post Office Limited, and um, we felt that we, we of course, were familiar with the prosecutions, uh, and um, we thought it would be uh, e easier for us to, to 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 continue the prosecutions. I mean, I know that some CPS did actually uh, prosecute our cases. But if they wanted to retain the papers, then they would retain the papers, and that was the end of it. Can we look, please, at poll 0010 6867, please? Um, this is a, a long um, email chain. Can we look at page 7, please? Um, can we see, we're going to come back to this chain um, later on um, today, but can we see here an email from you to Sue Lowther, Andy Hayward, Dave King, Dave Posnett, and David Smith? That's David X. Smith, yes? Yes. Dated the 9th of March, 2010. And you say, we have additional difficulties in relation to challenges to Horizon. Today I've been made aware of a prosecution being conducted by the CPS where Horizon is being challenged. The case may have already been identified by you. The difficulty, however, will be our lack of control over any case that's not being prosecuted by my team.
What were the additional difficulties you refer to in the first line? Well, it would be to do with whether the police could uh, obtain the, the relevant information from Fujitsu, whether they would know where uh, to obtain the evidence in relation to the uh, uh, that they would need in relation to the prosecution, um, and basically how how the system worked, whether they would be able to uh, glean enough information uh, to uh, sustain the prosecution. This um, exchange um, here is. Um, all in the middle of a discussion, I think you'll be aware, over what in the title is described as horizon disputed cases and whether to get in um, an external reviewer to validate the robustness of horizon. Yes. If there was no concern or question about horizon's integrity being able to be evidenced in court, why were you expressing a concern that you would lack control over any case that isn't prosecuted by your team? Well, it depended how the CPS would react to the prosecution and react to uh, uh, a request for disclosure. But, um, Mr. Wilson, if the CPS were applying the same code tests why would the post office be concerned about any question of horizon integrity being raised in a CPS-led prosecution? Because they might not know where to go to to obtain uh, the evidence. You could tell them. Just go off to Fujitsu. They'll help you out like they help us out. Yes, I could if they asked the question, yes. <coughs> You refer in the last paragraph to the lack of control. In what way did your team exert control over prosecutions involving horizon challenges? Well, our control would be over, over the investigators and uh, whether they'd uh, obtained uh, sufficient evidence. Were you concerned that if the CPS were involved in cases concerning challenges to horizon integrity, that the control that your team exerted over the revelation of problems with horizon integrity would be lost? Well, I don't think we were controlling the revelation of um, horizon issues. Is this a reference to the need to close down challenges to the integrity of horizon? No. To protect the position or the commercial position of the post office? No. And so why couldn't the post office just signpost uh, the CPS, if it was necessary, to Fujitsu. Well, we could we could have done if if they'd asked us the question. Asked the question. You think that they wouldn't ask the question? Well, I, I don't know what they would have asked. I, I all I think I, uh, that had happened here is I'd been told that uh, the CPS are prosecuting uh, one of the cases, so I'm not sure that I even knew where it was at the time. Were you essentially highlighting a, um, a, a red flag or raising a red flag here by saying, hold on, we can't just control our own prosecutions, the ones conducted by my team. If we start independently investigating Horizon through the use of an external expert, we've got to take into account with what the, C the CPS might do with such evidence? No, I, I mean, I can remember speaking to the Crown Prosecution Service about uh, some of our cases, 
that, the, that, that they, they had. But I would speak to them because I had knowledge of where they were and who, who, who they are, and I had a contact point. And no doubt that was found out by the investigator. So I'd ring them up uh, and uh, have a discussion. So I was perfectly happy to, to help the CPS uh, if they needed assistance. Can, that can come down, thank you. Can we turn to a, um, a different topic, disclosure? Uh, how did you and your colleagues in the criminal law team um, supervise the conduct of the disclosure process in criminal proceedings? Do you mean on an individual case basis? Yes. Yes, well, if you can describe what um, processes were in place, the roles undertaken by your team. Well, we would um, receive the case papers from the investigator uh, and uh, he would be asked to prepare a schedule of non-sensitive, unused material and highlight uh, whether there was any material that undermined or assisted undermined our case or assisted the defence. And uh, when the case had been uh, committed for trial, we would, uh, uh, we would receive uh, defence case state statements from the defence and we would submit those to the investigator to identify uh, any material that required to be disclosed if there was any issue in relation to the defence statement and it needed explaining, we would contact the solicitor and request an explanation. Um, we would uh, uh, resubmit any papers to the defence uh, that uh, provided additional uh, disclosure that the investigator had identified from the defence statement. Uh, and. Uh, we would keep the case uh, continually under review uh, until its conclusion. Uh, thank you. Um, in all of that, you mentioned going back to the investigator. Um, you didn't mention um, a disclosure officer. Well, the, the, dis uh, the disclosure officer could be the investigator. Normally, was the def uh, normally was the investigator. If the case was particularly complex uh, or voluminous, uh, then a, a separate disclosure officer would be designated to deal with the disclosure on that particular case. And did that happen in practice? Yes. Uh, was the process any different in cases which involved a challenge to the integrity of horizon data? No, I don't think so. Were any special instructions given to um, investigators or disclosure officers in cases involving challenges to the integrity of horizon as to what they should do about <laughs> disclosure in terms of uh, to whom they should turn in Fujitsu or within other parts of the post office? to obtain appropriate disclosure? I think the investigators knew more about who worked in the different uh, areas within Fujitsu uh, than, we, than, than the lawyers will have known. Uh, and therefore, they will have, had, they will have uh, developed contact points within Fujitsu to obtain the relevant uh, information that they needed to obtain. Can I um, look at something that the um, Court of Appeal Criminal Division um, uh, noted when considering disclosure um, in its judgment in the Hamilton and others um, appeals? Um, it, it, in fact, um, involves the, uh, the Seema Misra case, um, and we're going to return to that in detail in December. But um, I just want to look at this for present purposes because it concerns the completion of an unused material schedule. Can we turn up, please, poll 
And can we turn to page 24, please? And it's paragraph 91. Uh, the court says the material which we have seen includes other indications of the approach to horizon issues taken by at least some post office limited personnel involved in the conduct of these and similar prosecutions. That, for example, in relation to the prosecution of Seema Misra, an appellant in uh, whose case it is now accepted that there was a failure of disclosure, and then it continues. And um, it goes to Little Roman 2. It speaks about a, sensi uh, a schedule of sensitive material being prepared. Now, I'm not um, actually convinced that um, this um, schedule of material was um, a, a schedule relating to Seema Misra's case, despite what Lord Justice Holroyd says. But that um, does not matter for present purposes because it is an unused material schedule. It reads, on the 15th of January, a schedule of sensitive material was prepared. The disclosure officer who signed it um, stated she believed the single item listed on the schedule was sensitive. The item was described as, quote, article relating to the integrity of Horizon system supplied with the accompanying letter by defendant. The reason for sensitivity was said to be could be used as mitigation, i.e. to blame Horizon system for loss. Given that the item appears to have been a document supplied by the defence, the appellant was not in fact deprived of material she should have seen. But the important point for present purposes is that a post office employee acting as disclosure officer felt it appropriate to treat a document as sensitive and withheld it from disclosure because it could be used to assist the defence. Such an approach to disclosure is plainly wrong, but it does not appear that any action was taken by anyone on behalf of the Post Office Limited to correct the officer's serious um, error. I think you would probably agree that an approach of listing an article that came from the um, defendant which sought to blame Horizon for the loss and therefore could be used as mitigation is not a sufficient reason to put an item on an unused uh, material sensitive schedule. Yes. What um, level of supervision did your team exercise over the completion of unused material schedules, both sensitive and non-sensitive? Well, we would, look, we would uh, look at the schedule. Uh, we would copy the uh, material. And we would um, tick off, effectively, uh, whether, it was, uh, whether we agreed that it was uh, rightly placed on, on the schedule of unused material or whether it, sh whether, whether it should have been placed on another material, or whether it undermined the prosecution on a, a case or supported the defense. So we would have a look at the individual items. We would ensure that um, where there were a large number of documents that were being uh, produced uh, under a generic title, that they were split up. Uh, and described more uh, more properly, uh, and we would generally um, uh, uh, critique uh, what what we'd received. And so, it, it follows that this um, schedule would have passed through, or passed across the eyes of a member of your criminal law team. Yes. And I think you'd probably agree that it therefore paints something of a poor picture um, in relation to the safeguards in place. Yes. Was what we read here indicative of the attitude of the security team to challenges to Horizon? 
namely that they were seen as sensitive and something that should be hid away. I, 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 don't, th I don't think that was indicative. I think, um, I don't know who the disclosure officer was, uh, but it was completely inappropriate that, uh, and plainly wrong that that, that item should have been on uh, a schedule of sensitive material. Was it the case that the unearthing of any criticism of Horizon, even if it came from the defence, um, ought to be avoided because it was sensitive for the post office? I mean, you'll have to ask the investigators that, but uh, I, I, w I wouldn't have believed that uh, I, I, it's an extraordinary decision that, that this particular investigator made in relation to that document. Thank you, sir. We're about to turn to a new topic. I wonder whether we might break until two o'clock. Of course. So we'll resume at two o'clock. Thank you very much, sir.